All righty, guys, we're going to get started. I, um, I, um, my name is Kai Williamson, and not only uh, am I going to lead this presentation, but I'm also one of the instructors that you have to come through uh, for two of the required courses, and if you're interested in taking an elective with me. So uh, we're going to start off by doing introductions today. And what it is is I, I would really love for you guys to get a, uh, a look at what it's like to actually be in this profession. So I've invited some of my colleagues uh, to come and uh, be a part of this panel with me so you can speak to those working in law firms and or corporations in the legal department of a corporation to know what it's like to really work uh, as a paralegal in this profession. So not only will I be speaking from, even though I work here at UCI uh, as a, a instructor, I also am a um, paralegal. I've been a paralegal for 31 years and I, um, I do international corporate governance and uh, corporate paralegal. I form companies around the globe and I'll speak more about my uh, self later, but you'll hear from a criminal law a paralegal that does criminal defense. And you'll hear from another corporate paralegal that does litigation in a corporation and so on and so on. So again, I wanted to make sure you get a feel for what it's like to work in this profession by hearing from some of the professionals. And then I'll go into telling you more about the program, the costs and the classes and everything that you need to know about this program. So how about we start off with some introductions and then we can go into some nuts and cranny. And one of the things we definitely will be talking about is the pay that you'll get in this profession. But so we'll touch on a lot of different things. And we'd love if you if you could uh, if you have any questions in the Q and A, if you could uh, drop your questions there, that would be great. And we'll make sure we answer those questions, uh, even if I stop along the way or you want to wait to the end. Any questions you have, just let us know, and we'll be more than happy to answer those for you. So uh, we're going to start with Nick. Uh, Vicky is one of our other panelists. She will be here. She's just running a little bit late, but we'll start out with Nick, and we'll just uh, have. Uh, us do, we'll do some introductions for you, tell us a little bit about where we work at and what we do, and then we'll go in more of the next and cranny about our, our profession. So how about you go, Nick? Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, I got my paralegal certificate from UCI in October of 2019, so I do only have a little over three years of official paralegal experience, but before I got that, I was working at a law firm. I worked there for about three years. And then last October, I actually became an in-house paralegal for Vizio, and I do manage a lot of their litigation and some of their intellectual property. Wow, that's two different areas of law. Intellectual property, IP, which encompasses patents, trademarks, and copyrights, for those who don't know that. And then he does the litigation. And, and a lot of people probably think litigation is something that's done just in a law firm setting. But as Nick said, he works for a corporation, Vizio. Some of you guys probably have a Vizio TV in your house. And he does litigation for Vizio. He's, he works in a legal department and he does litigation. So um, we'll talk more about that with Nick. And how about you, Lorena? Go for it. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Thank no, no you. problem. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Lorena Hughes, and I, too, also graduated from UCI with a paralegal certificate. Uh, I am a criminal law paralegal, criminal law uh, defense uh, firm paralegal with the Law Offices of Virginia Landry. I've been there now for 14 years, and I do everything from uh, communicating directly with the clients to discovery review to writing motions. Um, so it is litigation, but in the criminal law field um, and been doing that for a while and then and I love it. Good and we'll speak more about your day in the life here in a minute and again as I was telling you even though I teach here at UCI in the paralegal program I do have a nine to five job and um, I've been a corporate paralegal international but I actually used to do just uh, North America all 50 states where I would form companies, form, maintain, and dissolve corporations. But in the last five years, I've actually started doing uh, international law. So I am a, I can 
definitely I'm a considered an international corporate paralegal and the corporation that I work for, they love to, like I'm in the middle of now of forming a couple of companies in different uh, parts of um, EMEA, uh, which is uh, Europe and uh, Africa, whatever. So I'm actually forming companies right now in Cairo, Egypt, Poland, uh, South Africa, and uh, it's another one, Colombia, and but, but which is as Latin America. So I form companies, and um, and my the corporate officers within the company decide what they want to do with those companies once they form. So that's my job is just to get it up and running, and I'm in the middle of doing that, and um, in the particular regions of the of the globe, and so um, that's what I I do. And again, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then we also have Gina on the call, Gina will be here to be able to, to take some of those calls, especially when we get to the part where we're tell, I'm telling you about the program. She'll be able to answer any of those burning questions that you have with respect to the cost and, and what it takes to get yourself enrolled in the program or whatever. So Gina's on the call as well. Hey, Gina. So um, hi, hi, Kai. I've also, um, I don't know if you want to get started with them. Um, I was going to monitor the question and the answer. We've already got some questions in oh, here. Wow, okay. Do you want to take them now or wait a little bit? Sure, we can take those now okay. and then. So just one, the first one is legal assistant versus paralegal question mark. You want to talk a little, or maybe that's part of your I love presentation. It. No, 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 no. And that's a great one. And, and we all can speak to that, but I'll start off by speaking to that. Para, what it is, is law firms, they, they put themselves, um, they want to make sure that they kind of level out the pay. So what they do is, is they'll call someone a legal assistant because they know they can pay them less. And then they, but a legal assistant and a paralegal by the state of California, by law and the definition of a paralegal are considered synonymous. They mean exactly the same thing. But what, what law firms will do is they'll have a paralegal one, two, and three. And then they'll tell you, oh, once you get past three, then you can be promoted to a paralegal. Once you get past a legal assistant one, two, or three, then you'll be voted to a paralegal and then you'll be a paralegal one, two, and three. And then you can become a senior paralegal and you know, so they have all these different levels to make it seems like and, and it gives them the opportunity to make it to where you can have a, a um, way up the ladder. But again, by law in the state of California, legal assistant, paralegal, document, I mean, there's so many other names for it. Uh, they have a whole list of names. They mean exactly the same thing. So even some, you have some law firms that say they're looking for a legal assistant in their resume uh, description, I'm sorry, in their job description, it means paralegal, but that means they're just gonna be paid less. So Vicki, uh, are you there yet? If so, you can unmute yourself and do introduction. She's not there, we're, I see she's kind of frozen, so we're. We'll wait for her. So anyway, um, oh, that's Kai, that one question. You got oh, another? Oh, Kai, while we're waiting, um, the, the, oh, you're still answering that last question? Because I've got another one for you. Because you talked about the different levels. Mm -hmm. This question is re in regards to um, pay increase. With more experience you get, mainly getting, um, I guess the person's asking for, uh, when do you expect someone to get six figures? How many years does it take on <laughs> average for a paralegal? We'll talk more so, about that in a minute, because yeah. I do have a couple of slides with, with respect to pay. And it just depends. And, and before, I just, just to give you a little teaser, here's what I'll say. And again, I have slides with respect to pay. Here's the teaser. One of my former students who's a, who graduated from the ABA paralegal program at Santa Ana College, uh, he only had two years of experience and he makes over six figures. And that was his second job into the paralegal profession that he did. His first job, he worked at a law firm for a little over a year. And he's been almost a year where he is now, which he has, he makes six figures. So it does not take long. And the reason it doesn't take long these days is because everyone's pay across the globe has gone up. But with respect to the legal profession, our pay has gone up just huge. It's, it's gone grown by leaps and bounds in this profession. And something that I can make sure I send you guys along the way, I want to make sure I get more into the presentation, but one of the things I can send you if you like, is I do have a salary survey uh, that and that's some of the stats that I do have in this PowerPoint is from a salary survey uh, that's specifically for Orange County, uh, but I also have one that's on a national level. So believe me, I want to make sure I talk about pay as well. <laughs> All righty, guys. So let's get started uh, with the um, actual slides. So here's some of the questions um, that we'll be talking about. Why become a paralegal? How's the job market for the profession? Which 
that's something you guys wanted to know. Um, why choose UCI as your uh, school of destination uh, or school of choice? And we'll talk about that too. So with respect to the paralegal profession, again, it's a great profession. You are second in line to an attorney. So for those who don't want to spend $200,000 going to law school, you can become a paralegal and make just as uh, good of a career path as you as you can as a an, as an attorney. And again, everyone on this phone can tell you uh, with respect to that. Wide variety of practice areas. Think of any area of law, and I bet you I have a colleague that works in that particular area of law. If you're considering law school, definitely stopping to be a paralegal for two to two to five years is probably a good idea. I can't say it's going to make it to where you where you when you go to law school that you'll just have a great three years because you'll know everything. But I'm telling you, at least that first year and a half, you're gonna breeze through from everything you know as a paralegal. And then of course, there's a plethora of job opportunities. Hey, Vicki, you wanna introduce yourself and then we'll get started. If you can just, just do an introduction and then we'll go into some of these panel panelist questions, but let's, if you can introduce yourself, that'd be great. Of course, of course, sorry about my no problem, everyone. No problem. Life and work sometimes get in the way, but my name is Vicki LaSalle. I am a manager of legal operations at a company called Beckman Culture. Um, we're located in Brea, California. I've been there for going to be 16 years next year. And I not only do paralegal work, but I actually manage not just legal operations in the department, but I have two people that report to me directly. I facilitate projects, special meetings, you name it, I'm probably gonna do it or have my hand in it in some way or another. Um, I actually graduated from UC Irvine. And is there anything else you want me? No, for right now, that's it. That's and, it? and again, okay, yeah, and I wanna make sure what Vicki says, something I wanna bring out is when you get to a level like a, a Lorena, Vicki or myself, when you're at that 15, 16 year plus type of paralegal and, you, and you've kind of reached the top, there are other opportunities that you can have. And, and Vicki and I are kind of from that perspective, like myself, I'm a director of legal operations at my job. So even though I'm a senior paralegal, I'm also a director, but that puts me in a whole nother pay scale. And the same with Vicki, she's, she's at a director level at her company. And then again, uh, which Lorena will tell you because she, even though she's in crim law, she's been at that same law firm from when she graduated UCI to now, and she's at a, a high level. Nick, as he already told you, he's only been a paralegal for three years. Nick was actually one of my former students, but, uh, but, but Nick, he's done well for the small amount of time he's been in the profession and he'll be able to tell you about that. So let's kind of dive into some of these questions from the panel. Again, these are working paralegals that can tell you all about the profession. So how about we dive into some of these questions? How did you find your current position? Uh, who do we want to start with? How about we start with you, Lorena? That's a fun question for you. And you're on mute. <laughs> I remember this time. <laughs> So I found my current position just through um, knowing people who knew people type of thing. And so uh, where I was working previously, um, I decided to, to resign from that career. And But I still knew a lot of people within that particular career. And um, I met somebody who worked in the, the law firm um, arena, and she introduced me to, to Virginia. And I met Virginia. I interviewed with Virginia. And, uh, and then from there, I, I started working with Virginia, still working with uh, Virginia there. And so really it's all the whole network, network, and then network some more. So whether it's within the legal industry or within your, you know, just local area, local community, um, wherever you know people, always get to know people because you never know who you're going to meet. So basically, but, but Lorena, the thing, and again, you know, I know all you guys' stories, but the thing that I want them to make sure you understand is that you came from a different profession into the legal profession. So, how about you tell them about that a little bit? I did. I, I used to work in the hospitality industry. So, I worked in hotels and restaurants. And within that uh, industry, I did work up to some higher levels of management as well. Um, so it was definitely more business related, business focused, did a lot of training, and I understood the whole, you know, profit and loss and what to do to get those numbers going, and which was one of the reasons why Virginia liked me so much is because I did have kind of a, a very well-rounded uh, background, and uh, and she was a smaller law firm, and she she wanted to build, and she wanted to train, 
And she said, you know what, I think I need to bring you on. So I did have some transferable skills, along with the fact that I was going to UCI and getting my paralegal certificate. And so that combined really intrigued her. And of course, I criminal law has always intrigued me. And, um, and we just ended up being such a great match. And so right. that's what happened. And that's the reason I wanted you to, to I wanted to pull that out of you is because someone on this call may be to where they're 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 not in legal, they know nothing about legal, but they come from a different profession. Just know that you can bring those uh, everything you learn at UCI along with your transferable skills and do really well in this profession. Yeah. So Nick, tell us a little bit about your, uh, as far as how did you find your current position? And it's going to be different for you because you went from a law firm to a corporation. I did. So I was in a law firm for about three years and we did mortgage real estate litigation. Um, ultimately decided mortgage wasn't the way I wanted to go. So I was actually browsing Indeed. And this kind of goes back to the legal assistant paralegal dynamic because I believe the position was a legal coordinator. And I know law firms and companies will get a little curious or interesting with the titles that they give. And then through my interview, I was able to demonstrate that, you know, I could do more than the job description required. And then eventually negotiated my way into a paralegal role here. Wow. And so ever since then. Right. So, so Nick, let's stay with you for a second before we go to Vicki. Litigation. Tell, uh, and again, I know you took, all of you guys are alumni of this program, so you can definitely tell them about the program, but litigation is where you find yourself. Even though you were in a law firm, now you work in the legal department of a corporation, but litigation is that practice area. Tell them what you do. Like, what is it that you do from a litigation side of things? Um, so from an in-house perspective, working at a company, a lot of litigation is more management. Um, usually when we have lawsuits come in, we'll hire outside counsel, which will be your law firms that I used to work at. And it's a lot of managing them to make sure that they're showing up to the hearings, that they're letting us know when things get pushed out. If we have a complaint or an answer or any discovery due that we get to review the drafts before that. Um, a lot of document collection when it comes to discovery, I handle and then I send out to the law firm and then they go from there. So it is much more of like a managerial role mm -hmm. being at a company than it would be at a firm where you're actually sitting there doing, you know, the case management statements, drafting the discovery responses. Right. It's a definitely a big difference in, in the way in which litigation is done working from a law firm to a corporation. But how did UCI's program prepare you from the litigation classes? Because that's two of the classes you guys will be taking if you come in this program is litigation one and litigation two. And litigation two is all discovery. For 10 full weeks, you will learn about discovery. So what is discovery, Nick? And tell them what they can learn from this program if they sign up for it. So to answer the first question, um, since I do work at a company, most of the time we are getting sued. So civil litigation one was really helpful because it teaches you how to draft an answer. We still do a little bit of complaints, but it's mostly drafting answers, reviewing them. And then when you go into civil litigation two, that's when all the discovery responses will be. And that's basically whatever is at issue in the case, there's gonna be a ton of documentation that comes along with it. If it's an employment case, let's say you've got emails between you know, four or five different people that weren't supposed to go out or are harassment or discriminatory, I have to go look for those emails. I have to be able to search for them. I have to be able to present them in a way that outside counsel can help with them. If it comes to like a patent litigation, I have to make sure that all of our technical specifications are in there. So that's, we sell TVs. So it's everything from panels to microchips to power cables, to user manuals. And so a lot of the discovery process is just getting all of that ready to go, making sure that you have what opposing counsel asked for, and then being able to transmit that to outside counsel 
and then working with them in case you might have missed the TV or you might have missed something. And then it's just constant back and forth getting them that information. Oh, perfect. So Vicki, are you there? We, what I want to know from you is tell us what a typical day looks like for you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my camera stopped working. No, no, so I'm that's trying fine. to unplug it. So for me, <laughs> a typical day, well, <laughs> depends on the day. My calls can start as early as 6 a.m. Um, I try not to let that happen. Usually 7 a.m. is the earliest I go. <clears throat> and then um, I can work late. Tonight I worked a little late, but not too late. I actually work with folks globally. So I support a lot of international um, um, operations that we have. So people that are located in other countries. So a lot of times I'm having a lot of these calls with people located, you know, either on the East Coast or in England or someplace in Europe. Um, I used to have a lot more calls with Asia Pacific area. I still do sometimes, but not as often, which is nice. So I don't have to work as much into the evening, but you know, it's, it's a busy day of meetings, phone calls, support. I could be working on a contract. I could be processing a legal hold. I can be, um, you know, gosh, what else can I be doing? Um, operationally, I could then be, you know, looking at invoices, making sure we have matters set up correctly in our e-billing system. Um, yeah, you name it, I might have my hand in it, like I said earlier. It's just a lot of different things on variety, which I love about this job. I, I rarely have time to be bored. Right. And again, as I was telling uh everyone, when you get to a certain level, and again, at a law firm, that's why when you work at a law firm as a paralegal, you get to you, you get to where you reach a plateau, unlike Lorena, she's in a very rare situation, but uh, because Lorena pretty much operates like an attorney at her firm, but at, at, at your typical law firm, you get to a point where you reach a plateau, not only in salary, but just in the duties that you do. But that's why if you go to work at a corporation, that's uh, that's where you can become directors and then you can go into the VP status and be, and I used to be VP of operations for First American title. So again, it's like, when do you hear about paralegals being VPs or directors or, or uh, legal managers or whatever? Those are additional uh, ways for you to kind of grow in the profession. Whereas if you're in a law firm and where do you go from senior paralegal to super senior paralegal? <laughs> so again, there is a there's different avenues in the legal profession that you can see as we're talking that you can see that you can go into from a law firm, you can transition to corporate and in corporate, you can get into director positions and VPs or what have you. So um, Lorena, question for you, what do you like least about your job? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I was thinking about this um, not too long ago, but I would say every once in a while, it doesn't happen often because I've learned how to manage, ma manage it pretty well by now, but every once in a while, we'll have a very, very, very demanding client or two um, who has unrealistic expectations about the system in general and how things need to get dismissed when there's... Um, a lot of evidence um, within the case that that's likely not going to happen. Uh, but I learned to manage clients' expectations because you kind of get the insight from the first phone call. Um, and so now we don't have as much of that because we kind of, again, um, will explain to them really how the system works. It's very slow. Um, things can take a lot longer than one would like things that are out of our control. Um, but yeah, every once in a while, that demanding client is not fun to, to work with, but you know. Mm -hmm. so, if I, so if I flip that question to what you like best about your job, what would it be? Well, what I like best about the job, honestly, are those uh, clients that are very responsive to the, the way we're working their case and the strategy and when they're actually doing what we're advising them to do throughout the case to be able to mitigate the case and the circumstances as much as possible. Um, I will say that um, also the I love reviewing discovery, comparing police reports with the actual, let's say the videos, audios, body-worn cameras, the interviews. 
um, I love that part of it as well, because anything that I can find, anything technical, anything that I can find, that's always going to help our case. And so um, I kind of feel like detective, you know, every, every so often. Um, but I would say those are the two things that I love the most. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we're going to, we're still going to be talking, but I just want uh, as everyone can see from the slide, talk about these different practice areas because, and there are certain areas that are hot now, more in demand than others, but just as a broad, I just want you to see all the different areas and some of the hot areas that are in demand may surprise some of you, like elder law. And I, I would believe that the pandemic brought that on uh, with respect to elder law being at the top. Estate planning, the pandemic definitely broaden a, a spectrum to where estate planning is such a hot area. Um, I, um, I'm the president of the Orange County Paralegal Association. And again, they think of San Francisco, San Diego, and, uh, and um, LA. They also have paralegal associations. And, and so the, all the major cities have them. And in these paralegal associations, we have different types of meetings, including like estate planning or whatever. But we also have a job bank. And in the job bank, we have so many estate planning positions that are opening up or that lawyers or law firms or HR departments are contacting me to put on our job bank. And I'm like, wow, it, it's, and it's, it's really been over the last couple of years, estate planning because of so many people when they died during the pandemic and they, were, they didn't have a living trust or wheels or this or that. And it really made a lot of people say, you know what, I need to get my business in order. And that's why estate planning has just blown up. Uh, do in in the um, in anyone's area of, of their profession right now, do they even do or touch on any estate planning at all? Lorena, do you at, at anything that you do from a criminal standpoint? Because I know some areas do fall upon estate planning, like family law. Family law, there is an estate planning side to it. But um, but yeah, family law by you see is on this list as well. In demand practice areas, family law. What again that is married to the whole trust and estate planning side of things. One that surprised me, but not really, is data privacy. N Does anyone on the panel want to speak to that? Nick, did, had you, had you guys had any issues, especially working in corporations for Nick and Vicky or myself, a lot of um, bad actors with respect to trying to, you know, take people's data or information or hold it hostage, a lot of corporations have been having problems with this. Has anyone had that kind of issue come up at their corporations here lately? And that's when they will hire an outside law firm. That's where the paralegals and attorneys have to kind of step in. And that's why that's one of those practice areas is because a lot of these uh, different things happen and it has a legal side to it with respect to data privacy. Vicki or Nick, have you guys had that problem oh. at your corporation? Um, we, uh, yes. And, it, you know, it goes data privacy, cybersecurity, um, yes. a lot of that goes hand in hand, you know, because, you know, we have businesses in Europe, we have to comply with GDPR. Yes. Um, that's a, a European regulation for um, personal data privacy and people's personal information. Um, we're not a business to customer um, uh, type of co company we're business to business so we don't have some of those um things don't apply to us like they would for some other companies such as with california um privacy law however it still applies when it comes to like former employees um, and still having somebody's personal email and things like that which we do get with some of our customer accounts so yeah it is a thing and i will say as a huge company you know, there's, we're all, always, always have people trying to, you know, break our security and, and get into our systems. Absolutely. <clears throat> and the same goes for my company. I mean, I, I'm, I actually um, um, sit in the board meetings with the executives, you know, the CEO, CFO and, and everyone. And we had a board meeting today and uh, our CTO, the you know chief technology officer was actually speaking about this as far as just you know, there's a lot of bad actors, but one thing he said, which was great that, he, you know, he was able to tell the board of directors was that, hey, even though people have tried, we've stepped in and we, we have, you know, a very powerful brick wall up to where no one can kind of touch our system. But believe me, he said they try on a daily basis. And again, they oh, try yeah. to hold your information hostage. So again, think about it. Someone on this call that is interested in technology side of things and they can wrap legal with the technology because there is a area for that data privacy. Yeah. 
Um, Hi, yeah. I just want to let you know when you're ready, we have um, several yes. questions. Yes, how about we go? How about we take and, some of those? How about we take and I, some of those? Okay, and I'm just going to say something to Gina right now. Gina, sure. there's a, like one or two to you. Um, so I'm going to go with the first question that was asked, and um, I think any one of us can answer this, maybe sure. not Nick so much, because Nick had legal experience, <laughs> um, but breaking into the legal field with no formal legal experience, but other work experience, question mark, yep, did that. Um, did that, and I'm sh and, and, and Lorena can say did that as well. We've yep. all done that, and, and Vicki was pretty much on the same level as me. I started at a law firm as a receptionist. <laughs> I was, I, started, the yep. I was the receptionist at the law firm. And that's when I actually befriended a paralegal. And then she, she was like, you should actually look into the paralegal, a paralegal position or paralegal program in order to become a paralegal. And that is where I got the interest. I had no idea. I wasn't interested in, in law. I had no ambitions on being an attorney, but it was me being the receptionist at a law firm that made that a reality. And I went from the reception desk to the file room and I became a file clerk. And that's when I really befriended a lot of the attorneys because the attorneys would need certain files and they would come to the file room. Hey, Kai, how you doing? Could you uh, give me the file on this case or that case? And so got to know a lot of attorneys. And then ultimately when I became, I went to school and got that paralegal certificate, that's when I was able to say, hey, you know, even though I've, I've had these other two jobs, I'm a paralegal now, got a paralegal position for me. And that's how I transitioned to being a, a paralegal at the law firm. Yep. Yeah. And I, I was actually already in the paralegal program there at UC Irvine. And I actually started at my first law firm as a file clerk. I had zero legal experience before that, but it was my foot in the door and it got me in. Yeah. Um, how big of a role does a bachelor's degree play? Is it necessary for climbing the ladder and making that money? That's a, that's a very good question. And again, I, there's, there's good, there's things to say on both sides. Does it help? Yes. Does a lot of job positions say that they want a bachelor's and the paralegal certificate, even though they're hiring for a paralegal, do they also say I want a bachelor's degree? Yes. However, can you do well without it and just have an associate's degree or no uh, type of uh, undergrad degree? Yes, I have. we have one of our colleagues, EJ, for instance. You guys know EJ just has an associate's degree in paralegal studies from a community college. And she is one of the top tier people making almost 200K at, um, at a, a company that she works for in the Inland Empire. And she has only associate's degree in paralegal studies. Uh, also, one of our board members, Kevin. Kevin makes over 100K, and he only has an associate's degree from Santa Ana College, um, and he does not have his bachelor's degree yet. So can you do well in this profession? Well, yes, we have people we can actually lean on to say that, and then, but, but, uh, but again, all of us do on this call have bachelor's and or master's. Uh, Vicki has an MBA. Um, I have a master's in education. Nick and Lorena definitely have their bachelor's degree, and I'm not sure if they're going to work on an even an advanced degree. So again, it's it's an, and um and not only that, we all uh, several of well, Nick and Vicky also have a uh, advanced certified paralegal. They're they're at another level where they did additional education on top of their paralegal certificate. So we're all highly educated, but is it necessary? No, we we have people where we can mm -hmm. say it's not necessary. So another question we have here is when it comes to like the certification that they would get here at UC Irvine, how transferable or recognizable is this going to be if they move to a different state? Or if they well, work the, you're, in you're, in, you're, you're in luck because yep. Texas, Arizona, California, and what's the other one? There's one, Florida. Florida. Those are the four states that regulate paralegals. By law, under Business and Profession Code 6450 here in the state of California, you cannot even call yourself a paralegal unless you meet certain criteria. So by you being in a state that actually already regulates paralegals, you're fine. Um, it's going to depend on where you are. If you're in one of those states, if not, you're fine being a paralegal. Uh, but again, you don't have to worry about it as much if you're in, if you get your certificate from a state that already regulates it. Vicki or Lorena or Nick, if you want to add on to what I just said. I think I could add on as well. Um, Kai mentioned that Vicki and I are both advanced certified paralegals, and that goes through NALA, which is the National Association of Legal Assistants. 
and it's a federal thing. So if you were moving to a different state that doesn't regulate paralegals, I can almost go anywhere and do federal law. So that does help open boundaries and doors if you did want to move from California to another state. So it would definitely be worth looking into. Definitely. Absolutely. What's the um, next? A few more questions. I'm going to go back and it's not one that's actually posted in Q&A, but this is one that was asked. I guess before I joined the call, so Gina, let me know about that. <laughs> <laughs> this will make some folks giggle. And I love the way they asked this. Is overtime plentiful in this industry? <laughs> what they we make can it sound so nice. I know what it is, huh? Um, if you took the course, I, we in the pr program, and, and I teach the first class that you have to take in the course, I talk a lot about this, uh, but there is a exempt and non-exempt side of things when this profession, but especially if you're new, you automatically are going to be non-exempt, which means you're going to get paid overtime. And that's if you're in a law firm and or a corporation working, you're going to get uh, be available for overtime. Plentiful, it just depends if you want it or not. A lot of law firms, especially if they're a bigger firm, they don't do as much overtime, but smaller firms, you will. Mm -hmm. And um, And again, I'll let others speak to that. I, I do it, but I'm a manager now, so it doesn't matter. Right. And so, it doesn't matter for me either because I'm, exe yeah. I'm exempt. We're exempt. Mm -hmm. We get a, just a, a nice high salary, just like an attorney would, you know. Yeah. So, um, Lorena, how, do you have to do overtime? No, I'm exempt too because I'm more See? of like a, pair of and, like yeah. a manager. Right. Right. Sort of thing. So, right. so I'm exempt. Yeah. So, again, you guys get to notice that we're all paralegals, but you can be exempt. But for the most part, especially if you're a newer paralegal, along the way, especially if you don't have direct reports, which we, uh, most of us on this call do have direct reports, you don't, you're, you're exempt. But there is an, uh, a, a, Nick, how about you? Can you answer this for us being the newbie? <laughs> um, so I'm actually exempt as well. Because you're in-house, yeah. I know that I work 8.30 to 5.30 being in-house, but I do think it definitely depends on the firm because I know Absolutely. a lot of litigation has its ebbs and flows. So if it's employment and then like something like COVID were to happen, there's going to be plenty of overtime. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, oh, no, no, I was going to say, and, it, and again, I can talk more about that if you were to take the class. But, you know, my base salary when I started mm -hmm. in this profession in a law firm uh, back many moons ago was 33K, but I can tell you now, I brought home about 68K a year. And that was because of overtime and billable hours, which we'll let Nick talk about in a minute, but billable hours, which automatically, if you you reach your billable at the, at the uh, there, you're given a goal. And if you're between January 1 and December 31st, if you reach that goal, you'll get a, a, a bonus. And I used to get a $10,000 bonus every year. So that 10,000 brought me to 43 and the rest was all the overtime, but I was bringing home close to 70K, even though my base salary was 33,000. And that's because of overtime and bonuses that a law firm does. Yeah. So we got a few more questions here and I'm gonna try and get through these fast. So I'm gonna like answer this first one, Kai. Sure. Tips Tips to go in-house ASAP. I guess it, it depends on what your background experience is and things like that. Most of the time to go in-house, you're going to be, have experience as a paralegal working in a law firm. That's going to be the case like 80, 90% of the time. It's rare that you'll find a brand new, fresh paralegal being hired into a company to go be in-house. However... Absolutely. It does happen. It does happen. It does mm -hmm. happen. So it's just a matter of looking for the right fit. When I was a, in a law firm, I did civil litigation. When I moved in house, I was managing litigation. And then I went corporate and, and then manager and all of that stuff. So it, it really depends on kind of what your background is and how and the opportunity in house if it's you know what type of paralegal it is there's all kinds of different roles um, for paralegals in house so the the opportunities definitely exist absolutely um, we talked about this a little bit about good benefits um, I would say yes um, we have a salary again, survey where we can yep. we can get you that information it shows exactly. all the benefits that paralegals get and everything and exactly. that was a Orange County specific we did a, a massive survey and over 200 paralegals responded to the questions and we asked us a plethora of different things, including what are your benefits and you name it, the benefits are pretty darn good. Yep. 
And, and, and I would say most people, you know, working full time as a paralegal, you're going to have for sure all your basic health benefits, usually some type of retirement. So, um, and then, you know, other perks that may be specific to that company. Correct. And then lastly, the one I want to go to right now, and then we'll, we'll go back kind of to the presentation is um, I know there are a range of paralegal jobs. So everyone's experience is different, but do you guys have a lot of time outside of work to spend with yourself and loved ones? Oh, please. Yes, I do. I'm actually about to go on a vacation now. Um, but again, it depends on where you work at, what kind of uh, plan as far as like your accrual or whatever. But where I work at being a director, I have unlimited vacation and, and PTO. I can just say I'm taking a month off. It doesn't matter. I don't, I'm not, I don't accrue anymore. I just can take it off. I don't have to account for anything. But again, everyone doesn't have that like me. But yeah, so that and what it is, is I take a vacation every couple of months. I'm, I'm out the door. My husband and I are going away somewhere. But next month, we're going on a, 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 on a Mexican Riviera cruise. And then, you know, we're going somewhere again in June. And we're going somewhere again in August. No. So, I mean, as far as for me, I'm, I'm getting my time off. <laughs> How about everyone else? Which I already know the answer to this because they're always going places too. <laughs> Lorena, how about you? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, my flexibility is pretty, I call it extreme flexibility because I can take whatever time I need off. Um, I rarely work really after five. Well, you know, after COVID, it's kind of like one of those things where I can work um, in the morning here in, the, in my home office and then drive like four minutes away to my law, like law office because we mm -hmm. moved close by. And then just kind of do the whole, you know, if I if I work start working later on, then maybe I can do a little bit of work li like later on in the day. It's just extreme flexibility. So yeah, I yeah. have plenty of time to do stuff with my yeah. family and friends. <laughs> and and for the most part, I can truly say, and I want to move these this PowerPoints along uh, before we run out of time. But and again, we'll stay if you guys stay, but we want to make sure we're respectful of your time. But yeah, we, we, it's a lot of flexibility. And I think COVID showed corporations and law firms that they needed to be flexible because we, paralegals and attorneys, are in the driver's seat. We, and again, I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides. We told them we want to stay home. So now, even if you do have to go in the office, which a couple of them will be able to tell you, even if you do have to go in the office, I don't. I've been home since March of 2020. I don't go in anybody's office. But the others, they can tell you they only go in their office twice a, twice a week. That's it. Because that's something that changed with COVID. Higher pay, less demand to go in the office. You, you tell them what you want. And, and they had to oblige. And here's um, a position that I, because we we're telling you that the, the, the uh, salaries have gone through the roof. Look at this particular position. This is a corporate position, corporate meeting, working. But this is for a law firm. This is not for a corporation, but it's a corporate position. And you can see that not only are they giving, you can say it's supposed to start January, February, but look, salary is between 90 and 190 dollars, uh, uh, 190 thousand, between 90 thousand and 190 thousand uh, plus a bonus, a signing bonus. That's the kind of stuff we're dealing with right now, guys. So, and this is from one of the legal recruiters that I work with even at, here at UCI because I, I teach a class called Legal Career Skills and she comes in to interview students for me. And that's Sherry Estrin. Yes, guys, we have jobs that are over a couple of hundred K per year. And, and no one probably the thought paralegals can make that much. And some of us were already making that before COVID and before, before salaries went up. Um, but because of uh, some of us have like 25 to 35 years of experience, well, I'm at 31. But, but you can imagine someone being at their job 31 years that they should be at six figures or way higher in the six figure range. Um, and so it just depends. So just keep that in mind. Also, here's what I was telling you about the flexible hours. Remote options and flexibility it is here to stay we are in demand we the paralegals and attorneys i'll speak for attorneys too we're the ones that say we didn't want this and that's why at these law firms and corporations even if you do have to go in it's no more than two twice a week and other than that you're at home or if you're at home um, period 
all the time. And so this is just some stack. I can make sure you guys get this PowerPoint so you can look at these things. These, some of these little um, things that I'm showing you are coming from a salary survey that I told you I have, but I actually just took some of it from the salary survey and just plopped it into my PowerPoint. But it tells you about all these kind of things. So let's get to the pay. So here in Orange County, and you can see this, the first one, and again, I'm not sure how big your screen is where you can see this, but again, I can make sure you have copies of this information, but but paralegals here in Orange County, and it goes by a 25 to 75 percentile, but uh, paralegals that have zero to four years of experience can um, stand to make up to like 85K. And again, I think that's a little bit low. Uh, now, mm -hmm. even though this is a 2023 survey, but four plus years, you're gonna be making about 115K or more. And you can see the numbers here. And again, I this I love this survey because it actually breaks it down by county. You got the LA County, Orange County, Inland County, and some other uh, states as well. And this is for uh, law firms, whether it be small, big. And you can see there's other titles besides paralegal and there's legal secretaries, legal management support attorneys, uh, paralegals here. And then I also also have it for Northern California, if some of the someone's on the call that's from Northern California. And again, guys, I have the whole 33 page survey. If you're interested, I can make sure I get that to Gina to send out to everyone. So you can really break down the stats, but I can tell you now the average salary for a paralegal uh, in this profession right now uh, with zero to four years is about 85K, 85K. So why UCI, uh, this is, she was one of my former students and a quick quick thing about them, I'm not gonna show this video, but just a quick thing about her. She was one of the students that passed up law firm. When I was working at uh, Bank of America, Carrington Mortgage Holdings, um, she, uh, my, one, of my, one of the colleagues that I work with was looking for a couple of people to come in to be compliance coordinators. And so I hired her and another one of my students to come in and neither one of them ever had to touch a law firm. They went straight from paralegal school at UCI to working in a corporation. So we talked about those rare opportunities that can happen because she's today, she still works for um, the corporation and she is a litigation paralegal. She does all the lit litigation paralegal uh, work for the, for the corporation, but she never had to work in a law firm. She doesn't work in a law firm and never had to. So why UCI? over 42 plus years and counting uh, in the paralegal program. It's an ABA approved program, very unique. We know that UCI, all the UCs, but UCI in particular, you know, I'm being very, you know, cause I love it, but uh, very top tier school. Um, and it gets you ready for this program. Here's the front page of my um, class that you'll have to take with me. This class, even though it's called Fundamentals of Paralegal Profession, basically is considered the introduction to law. And every week, it's a t all of the classes here are 10 week courses. We go on the quarter system here at UCI. So each class is 10 weeks. And this is the first class that you have to take. It's a required course. And every week I talk about a different area of practice. So I, I'll, I'll start off about the paralegal profession. I'll talk about the court system. I'll talk about crim law. I'll talk about torts. I'll talk about contracts. I'll talk about, um, what else do I cover? Fa corporate law, family law, real estate law. See, every week I have a different lecture on a different area of law. That's why I like to call the class introduction to the law because you get a feel for all these different areas. And I bring in guest speakers, which you're looking at three of them. They come to my class and they come in and talk about their day in the life of what it is they do. They get a whole hour to speak on what it is they do. And someone like Lorena, for instance, she talks about a lot of the cases that she works on because a lot of people are interested in crim law. And so she really talks and brings in some of those real cases that she's that they settled or help people get out, get, you know, get uh, information or whatever. It's a really uh, cool way. And that's the way in which we do it here at UCI. So the program itself uh, is 30 units. And you can take the program part-time and or full-time. Full-time is, of course, that's someone who's working a regular full-time job. You can take the full or part-time. Part-time is if you're working a full-time job and you would take classes in the evening. The classes in the evening usually run from 6.30 to 9.30. And uh, the, the full-time program, that's, that's you really can't work. because That's like nine to five Monday through Friday where you and you're finishing the program in three months. But it's, it's hardcore 
but it can be done. We've been doing it for six years now we, we, that we went to a full-time program. And it's called the compressed program because you're getting a lot, but you're getting it in three months. Whereas the part-time, you can have the part-time program done in about a year to, to a year and a couple of months. Nick and Vicki and Lorena, tell us, Nick, how about you? How long did it take you to finish the program doing it part-time? I can't, I can't see your, your thing. So, so I'm not, he, he, when he open up his mic, we can find yeah. out. Oh. That, so when I took the program a long time ago, it was <laughs> um, uh, 15 months. Okay. So it took you 15 months. I know some of my yeah. students have finished it and it just depends because you can take four classes a quarter. And again, even if you're working full-time, they may seem like a lot, but some of the class, two or three of the classes we have, they're, they're not 10 weeks. Like we have one class that's called legal career skills. It's only four weeks. We have ethics class that's five weeks. So if you took a 10 week, a four week and a five week, that's three classes you can knock out and you can do it on a level to where you, sh it, sh it can be obtainable. So, so uh, we have just a, kind of... well, I was going to say, we have a question kind of relevant sure. to everything we're talking about. And this particular person wants to know if employers look down on online programs. Well, here's the thing, because of COVID, this is another thing we talked about all those different new areas of practice because of COVID. The ABA, the American Bar Association changed the rules because of COVID. So now you can do a program totally online where you couldn't before COVID. You had to do only half, out of the 30 units, half of them had to be, 15 of them had to be done in a classroom and you could do 15 online. Now the ABA, because of COVID has said, we will accept total programs <clears throat> are done online. But here's the, here's the kicker guys, for all you guys listening in. You're not online to where you're on your own. We're doing it like this, I'm live. You're asking questions, we're talking, we're, we're, we're communicating. This is gone, we consider it, we consider it remote. So it's a live class. You have live classes with us. We're just not in a classroom setting. It's not on your own where you're on a, on, you know, like the, no, it's live. It's not to where you're on your own, just doing your work when you want to, no. So keep that in mind. And I actually have the, in red, I'm showing you with a combination of live and, and um, asynchronous, which is the pre-recorded lectures. I do have some pre-recorded lectures, but I'm also live, right? So you can hear me live, re-record it, and then I put it on for you to listen to later if you need to, okay? So you can see that your program can be done from three months to a year and a half. It just depends on you. And here's the cost of the program. That's the cost, and I'm sure Gene is covering that. So what are the next steps? Here are the classes and when they start. Fundamentals, I told you, it's a required course. It starts on January 9th. Legal career skills is a required course. It starts on January 30th. Corporate law, that's another class I teach here, is an elective. Corporate law and the internship program, which I run as well, both of those are electives because you buy, uh, in this program, you have to take at least two electives. So. Uh, the other electives besides corporate and internship is torts and IP. They have IP law and torts, but corporate law uh, is another okay. elective that we have. And we have the internship program. Okay. And those are the dates of these classes starting. If you're interested in coming in on the winter quarter, you would start with me on January the 9th. So we have other questions. Um, there are actually ones that are more for Gina, so I'm okay. letting her answer those. Perfect, perfect. So um, Nick, we lost oh, the, Nick. Oh, we, we lost. That's Nick. why we. Okay, he kind of froze it. So Lorena, yeah. tell tell um, if you could tell the um, everyone here having a notary certificate, and we all can speak to that because Vicky, you're a notary. Lorena, you're a notary, and I'm a notary. How do we use our notary license as a paralegal? Because I we all use it differently in our in our uh, profession, but again, that's something else that you can add on to your profession or, or be, become a professional is that you can be a licensed notary along with your paralegal certificate and how it's used. Lorena, tell us how you use your notary certificate. Sure. Well, specifically for criminal law, the reason why um, I was put through uh, the notary classes to get my commission, and I've already uh, renewed like 
two or three times. Um, but uh, specifically in criminal law, when we have clients with misdemeanor cases, there's a big difference between a misdemeanor case and a felony case. Felony case is a much higher level offense. But for misdemeanor cases, um, we can handle cases where the client never has to step foot in court and um, from the beginning of the case to the resolution of the case and judges will um, accept most judges some judges are will have their particular rules but most judges will accept um, a notarized uh, plea agreement for us to submit so fast forward to the end of the case and as long as that plea agreement is notarized then typically the judge will accept that again, without our client ever having to step foot in court. So that's one of the, the benefits of having a private attorney in the criminal defense field. Um, there are some exceptions, as there are always exceptions to, to uh, things in the legal field, but that's in particular a big benefit for our misdemeanor clients. Right. And for me, um, or Vicki, you might want to take it, but the way in which we use it, but the reason, the way in which I use it as an international corporate paralegal where I form corporations, is I have a good example of that. I'm in the middle of forming a company in Cairo, Egypt. Egypt is a country that's not at a part of the Hague Treaty, which means that certain doc and countries that are a part of the Hague Treaty, you just, um, me as a notary, I would actually send a notarized document to the Secretary of State and then they would apostille the document to be used in another country. Like, and, and the type of document to be used are maybe articles of incorporation from your US corporation or whatever, and it may need to be used in a different country. But Egypt, because they're not a part of the Hague, I actually have to send my documents to the embassy or the U.S. State Department in D.C. to actually be legalized to be used in Egypt. So being a notary doing international law is key. And also I used to use it when I was a real estate paralegal. So I used to work at First American Title. I worked at a couple other mortgage companies in my 31 years of being a paralegal. And in mortgage, I'm I dealt with a lot of real estate documents and real estate documents definitely have to be notarized. So um, being a notary doing real estate and or legal international is, is a must. Vicki, do you use it in any other way besides what I said? No, pretty much what you said, and this all has to do with um, notarizing stuff, usually for documents that have official documents that have to be used outside of the country, or if I notarize somebody's signature and it needs to be used outside the country, you know, that's, right. that's a lot of what we're doing. I do have a couple of questions okay. here, or actually just one, because Gina's typing the answer to one. Um, this person would like to know, how do they wow their interviewer when they have no experience and I don't understand <laughs> quite what they mean by no experience um I will I tell know, you go I'm sorry, I, I noticed that they that's something that everyone oh, this is the second kind of question we've gotten yeah. like that yeah yeah and I will say no experience if <clears throat> I I had no legal experience when I first started my legal career I worked retail and I did um I was a city of Irvine recreation leader. So I did through the city, we had um, after school um, camps, spring and summer and winter break camps. And I taught preschool classes. I was able to use the general skills for organizing, planning, those types of events and classes, those camps and everything to get that um, file clerk position. I had to be organized. I had to have a plan. I had to execute on that plan. So these are a lot of those basic skills that I think a lot of um, employers like to see, regardless of your experience in the legal field. Absolutely. And I have one other thing I want to say about that. UCI prepares you for that. One of the classes that's required course that you heard me talk about right here, legal career skills, that's why it's called that, and it's required this is a four week course, but we prep you, we UCI, and this is the class that I'm, I'm the one who teach it if you were to take it in the part-time program with me. I actually bring in for the final exam, legal recruiters that will prep you. The, the final exam is for you to interview with them. So they actually will look at your resume, rip it apart, tell you what you're doing wrong, what you should say. They prepare you to actually start going on interviews. And who, who all these 30 plus year experienced recruiters you have your hand at and you can actually, and they wanna talk to you and help you find a job and they're all connected with UCI. 
So let just know that you will leave this program well prepared. And that is why we have this four week course to prepare. And, and again, this particular class, we want you to take towards the end of your program to where you're, once you have all that and have those interviews under your belt and have that beautiful resume, now it's time to go out and find a job and you're well equipped to do so. We prepare you. So keep that in mind. Any other questions that, that you guys have for us? Because we want to be respectful of your time. Yep. There's um, nothing. Oh, okay. what is, um, that's for Gina. Okay. People asking what the first step, how do they get started? Perfect. What do they need to do Nick, to enroll? Okay, no problem. Nick, could you tell um, them how long you, how long did it take for you to finish the program? Because uh, we know it can be up to a year and a half, but I think you did it in less time than that, right? So I actually did it in a year and a half. Oh, you did do it a year and a half? Okay. I did do it leisurely because I had a few vacations planned and then <laughs> work on top of that. I figured I'd take it a little slow. Mm -hmm. What about some of the other classes that you took that you that you think that they should definitely make sure they pay attention to? Like how about legal research or legal or legal writing or contracts? What 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 can you say about those courses? So I think legal research and legal writing have been the most that I've used in my day to day when it comes to, you know, writing litigation holds, reviewing answers, making sure everything flows really well, making sure the case is cited or still good cases to cite. And so I think those were my two most used. And so those are the ones I'd recommend. If you do plan on going in house, there's a ton of contracts. So if that's the route you want to go, definitely pay attention in your contracts class. Big time. And Vicki, could you speak to the whole contracts and what type of stuff they would be looking, seeing in if they did contract law? Because that is an area, and even one of our colleagues that's on the board of directors with us for the Orange County Paralegal Association, she works for Edward Life Sciences. She contacted me today and said she's sending me three positions. She's, she's a manager and she's hiring three positions in her uh, department at Edward Life Sciences. Uh, and I'm, all of us have probably heard of this company, a very, um, very well-known um, biomedical healthcare type of company. And um, contracts, 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 that's the department she works in. And there's so many positions out there, huh, Vicki, and contracts. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Contracts is the bread and butter of any company out there. I mean, you have to have a contract to sell stuff. You have to have a contract if you're going to have a supplier supply you with, um, you know, if, um, raw materials to manufacture that and then sell it. So contracts are essential to every company. And really, you want your written skills to shine. So when you're going through your cover letter, when you're going through your resume, do not have a single error in it. Don't have any misspellings, don't have any um, grammatical, no punctuation errors, none of that. Because if you wanna do contracts, your attentional detail has to be spot on. Right. And again, there's a lot of jobs out there in the contract arena. So if any, anyone's in that area now and they wanna wrap legal around it and get a positions in the legal department of different corporations and healthcare by far, which we had already talked about is one of those areas that is a uh, very high in demand right now because of COVID and the and the um, and the, you know they said healthcare right here in demand practice area healthcare that's all contracts <laughs> that's just contracts 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 all right Gina are you done are we are we good because we don't want to hold it um, anyone else if they if they're um, I yeah, think I've got all the questions that uh, related to. Uh, program acceptance and I sent my email um, on there and you've got my email address on the website so I think uh, I think we're good to go awesome well thank you everybody for joining us and uh, I hope to see you in my class on January 9th bye-bye <laughs> thank you so much everyone bye thank bye. you thank you panelists bye-bye <laughs>